All right, everybody, welcome back. In today's lesson here, we are going to be talking about how we approach a very important question when it comes to our patients. Are they fluid responders? Does our patient need fluids or do they need something else? We find that about 50% of our patients respond to fluid while the other half just don't. Since there are some very serious consequences to using fluid in the critically ill, there has to be some way to determine who is going to respond with better odds than just a coin flip. In this lesson here, I'm going to dive into some of the strategies that we have to evaluate our patient's fluid responsiveness. All right, you guys, and welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal with this channel is to try to give you the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. I hope that I'm able to do just that for you guys, and if I am, I invite you to subscribe to the channel below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. And then when you're done with the lesson, make sure you head on over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link down in the lesson description to take the quiz on this lesson here and be entered into our weekly drawings for gift cards. All right, so with that out of the way, the great question of whether or not our patients need fluid is really one of the great challenges that has existed since the dawn of critical care management. Fluids for patients who need them can be a very important tool in helping to optimize our patient but for others can have very real consequences that will not only work against us, but can also increase length of stay and mortality. And so for these reasons, we need to have a way to try and determine as best as we possibly can whether our patient will actually need fluids or whether we need to try some other approaches. And the fact of the matter is that some just don't. Now, in order to better understand the why behind the use of fluids, we really need to understand what we hope to achieve by actually giving them fluids. And so let's talk about that. Why do we give fluids? So with our patients in the multitude of different ICUs and different physiological processes that they have going on, there can really be a wide variety of reasons that are contributing to the need of fluids. Our patients could be bleeding and hypovolemic. They could be dehydrated and hypovolemic. They could be septic and having a relative hypovolemia. Very different processes, but the same end result that the volume of blood returning to the heart, aka our preload, is not enough to support an adequate cardiac output and thus an adequate perfusion. And so in order to better understand why this is, we need to bring up everyone's favorite friend, the Frank Starling Law, and really the Frank Starling Curve. Now, while I'm not going to go into detail about it here, you need to understand the basics of what this all means to your patient. And the essence of what they described was that the length of the myocardial tissue is directly related to the force of the subsequent contraction. The more we stretch the muscle fibers, the stronger they're going to contract. And what stretches these fibers is what we refer to as our preload. So when we look at the graph of the curve, we have preload on the bottom and stroke volume on the left-hand side. And then here we have an example of a curve of a normal patient. The key takeaway here is that on the left side of this curve, if we increase our preload, we also see an increase in their stroke volume. These are actually patients who we consider to be preload dependent. Now, as we move further to the right, we begin to see the curve flatten and increases in preload are really met with less and less of an increase in stroke volume until we either see no change and then even some decrease if we go further. These are the patients who are preload independent. And what this all means is that our patient who is preload dependent will see a benefit to their stroke volume if we give them fluid and the patient who is preload independent will not. Now important to know too is that the shape and position of the curve will vary between individuals. So here we have an example of a hyperdynamic patient. Here would be a hypodynamic patient. And then down here would be an example of someone in cardiogenic shock. As you can see, depending on what's going on with our patient and how their particular curve is, 
we're going to find very different responses to various different amounts of preload and or changes in that preload. Now, this is very simplistic, but this is the core of what we need to understand to try and determine if our patients need fluid or not. If we will not see an increase in their stroke volume, thus their cardiac output, we really shouldn't be giving them fluid. So now that we understand what we're trying to do with fluids, we're left with the age-old question. How do we know if they need fluids? How do we know where on the Frank Starling curve they reside? And then remember that our patient does not present at one point on the curve and stay there. As things change with them, so does the dynamic of whether or not they're going to respond to fluid. And so over time, we've developed different assessments and measures to try and determine our patient's fluid responsiveness. And really the first of these that I want to talk about are going to be our clinical indications. At the heart of anything we do, we need to always take in the information that is readily available to us. The most basic, but sometimes underestimated of these is going to be that look, listen, feel approach of our assessment. There is a lot of information that's at our disposal here that can be indicators that our patient may need fluid. The first of these indicators is going to be our patient's heart rate. Now here, an elevated heart rate may be a sign of compensation in the presence of hypovolemia and decreased perfusion. With our patient's blood pressure, a decreasing blood pressure, especially in the presence of that elevated heart rate, can again be a sign that the compensation mechanism is not enough to really sustain the perfusion. We can also look at our patient's respiratory rate. Sustained hypoperfusion can really lead to rising lactate and metabolic acidosis, to which the body may increase the respiratory rate to try and blow off CO2 and compensate for this acidosis. We can also keep an eye on our patient's urine output. A decrease in the urine output to less than one milligram per kilogram per hour may be a sign that your patient is in need of fluids. Now we do also have some assessment findings that may also alert us to the possibility of needing fluids. These would be things like decreased capillary refill, weakened peripheral pulses, cool clammy skin, and dry mucous membranes. And then finally, we can look at some of our lab findings like elevated BUN and creatinine, transaminitis, elevated lactic acid, and then hemoconcentration with an elevated hematocrit. Now, while each of these alone may not tell us if our patient needs fluid, you do want to look at the collection of information as a whole, as well as really considering what is going on with our patient, and this is going to help to guide our thinking of whether or not they would respond to fluid. And so this kind of leads into talking about some of our static versus dynamic measures. So after taking in all the clinical indications, we can also assess other information that may be at our disposal to try and determine where they might be on that Frank Starling curve. When we talk about these other measures, we can think of them as either being static or dynamic. Now, static measures are a single perspective on what is going on. One pressure, one reading, much of our clinical indications that I just talked about are actually static measures. They only give us information at a moment in time and are only looking at a single factor. Now, our dynamic measures, on the other hand, will look at the relationship between two factors, the heart and the lungs. And this will make much more sense in a minute as I talk about our different dynamic measurements. So the first of these measures that I want to talk about is actually going to be our central venous pressure or our CVP. So this, which we obtain from either a central line or a swan, is still one of the most widely used indicators for preload. And in fact, studies have found that a third of providers are using this measure. And in many cases, this may be one of our only indicator measures that we have available to us. And the thought here is that CVP directly relates to our patient's preload. And so what this should really tell us is that the lower the CVP, the more responsive someone should be to fluid, and the higher, the less responsive. So if I drew that out on a graph here and we looked at our CVP and our patient's fluid responsiveness, as we begin increasing the CVP, we should see the patients become less responsive to fluid. And in healthy individuals, we actually find this to be true. The problem that we find is that when dealing with critically ill patients, when they looked at the data and really plotted the CVP and whether the patients responded to fluid, this is actually what we found. 
CVP would seem to have no real correlation with whether a patient is fluid responsive. And so CVP is actually something that we consider to be a static measure. It does not take into account other factors that can also be working either for or against our ability to stretch that myocardial tissue for any given CVP. It's simply a measure of pressure at a moment in time and doesn't take in these other factors. So for example, an older gentleman who has a non-compliant stiff ventricle may have a quote-unquote high CVP and be normal and still fluid responsive. A younger person with a compliant ventricle could have the same CVP and be off on the fluid independent part of the curve. The number itself doesn't tell us anything. Now from here we can talk about our pulmonary artery occlusive pressure or our pulmonary capillary reg pressure, whatever you want to call it. Here we're using a swan to get the pressure inside of the pulmonary artery. And we use this as a surrogate for left-sided preload. Now, as you can probably figure out, once again, we face some of the same challenges when we're using this static parameter, and it doesn't take into account other things that could impact what this pressure is. And so just like with the CBP in these critically ill patients, we tend to find that there's really no correlation between this number and whether a patient is fluid responsive. And so that leads me in to talk about a couple other measures that we have. And these are ones that we actually classify as dynamic measures. And again, for the dynamic measure, we're looking at the relationship between the heart and the lungs. So what's happening here is that as the lungs expand, they increase our intrathoracic pressure. This increase in intrathoracic pressure is going to reduce venous return to the heart, decreasing our preload. It also puts pressure on the heart and decreases its filling volume as well. As a result, with inflated lungs, we see decreases in stroke volume. Now, as the lungs deflate, we see the intrathoracic pressure go down, increasing preload, and then thus increasing stroke volume. And so this expansion, deflation, inspiration, expiration leads to cyclical changes in our patient's stroke volume, which we can actually measure. When a patient is fluid dependent, we see greater variation, and thus we find these dynamic measures to actually be better indicators of fluid responsiveness. And these two different measures are something that we refer to as pulse pressure variation, or PPV, and stroke volume variation, or SVV. Now, PPV and SVV are just two different measures of essentially the same thing. And so let's start off talking about our pulse pressure variation. So here, when we look at this pulse pressure, this is going to be the difference from the end diastolic pressure to the peak systolic pressure. And so here's an example of an arterial tracing, and you can definitely see that variation. In fact, I'm sure you guys have probably seen this before on the monitor. And what we can do is we can actually measure these points and these values, and we're going to compare the pulse pressure from the highest point that we see here, which is going to be at the end of expiration, to the lowest point down here, which is going to be the end of inspiration. When we compare those two pulse pressures, we can see the difference between them. If we find this difference to be greater than or equal to 13%, this patient is going to be fluid responsive. Now when we look at our stroke volume variation, that this actually requires special equipment, something like the Vigileo or the flow track, uh, and it has to be able to calculate the area underneath the arterial tracing as you see here, up until the aortic valve closes at the aortic notch. Now here then, what we're going to do is we're going to compare this volume again at the highest point end of expiration to the lowest point end of inspiration, and then see what kind of variance we have. If it's greater than or equal to 13% again, once again, these patients are going to be fluid responsive. Now as I said, these dynamic measures we actually found to be good indicators of fluid responsiveness in our patients, but unfortunately we do have some limitations with them. They really only hold true as a measure of fluid responsiveness in certain situations. First, our patients have to be mechanically ventilated on positive pressure ventilation. They also have to be synchronous with that ventilation. We actually have to be giving them 8 milliliters per kilogram for their volumes, and they have to have moderate amount of PEEP, so less than 10. In addition to that, they also have to have a regular rhythm. They have to have normal intra-abdominal pressure as well as normal thoracic compliance. If all of this isn't true, then we really can't rely on these measures to be good indicators of whether our patients are fluid responsive. And so our patient who is awake and spontaneously breathing, this is going to be of no value to us. 
Now, another possible way to get some measures is going to be with the use of bedside ultrasound. Now, we've actually seen a growth in the use of bedside ultrasound to help evaluate the critically ill patient, and it's great because this is a non-invasive tool with a lower risk profile, especially when comparing it against something like the insertion of a swan. And there's actually a lot that can be determined with ultrasound, but when it comes to fluid responsiveness, there are a few main things that we're looking for. Now, keep in mind this is going to be a very quick overview of these here, but one of the things that we look for is our IVC diameter and its collapsibility. Now this though is actually correlated with right atrial pressure or CVP, thus this is just another static measure. We can also look at the IVC distensibility index. This is going to be a dynamic measure of the change in size of the IVC with respirations on a mechanically intubated patient. And so again, we're going to see some of the same limitations that we see with our pulse pressure variation and our stroke volume variation. We can also look at our subaortic pulse velocity, and here we're comparing the velocity of variation of blood being ejected into the aorta. And once again, this is another dynamic measure and still has those same limitations with our PPV or our SVV. There's another test we can do, which is the end expiratory occlusive test. And so here we're going to do an end expiratory pause maneuver, and we're going to check for variability in the IVC diameter with respiration. Now once again, this is another dynamic measure and has its limitations, but these limitations are actually less than with our PPV or SVV, and we can use this with patients who are doing some spontaneous breathing. With the ultrasound, we can also determine our patient's stroke volume. This is a calculation that uses the velocity time integral as well as the LVOT size. And this can be used to evaluate as well as determine changes in our patient's stroke volume. So again, with the ultrasound, like other measures, there are potential issues in being able to truly determine our patient's fluid volume status. And really, we should treat this as, once again, another quiver in our toolkit for evaluating all the information that we have on what's going on. All right, so we've covered many different measures of possible indicators of fluid responsiveness, both from static to dynamic measures. Now. While the dynamic measures do offer greater indication of the true volume status of our patient, just like with static measures, they do have their limitations in some situations. Now, given the complexities and limitations, it is important that we take all this information together in the context of what's going on with our patient and try and best determine what their fluid volume status is. This really isn't an exact science. We don't have any foolproof way to say 100% that this patient is going to be fluid responsive. And so that really leads us to ask, is there even a way to truly dynamically determine for any patient, especially the awake patient, if they would benefit from fluids? And so here, enter our passive leg raise or PLR. So the beauty of the passive leg raise is that this technique can work on both our awake and our intubated patients, and is really pretty simple to perform. So the way this works is we start with the patient sitting up at 45 degrees. And we do need to have a way to measure their stroke volume or their cardiac output. And so this can be done with a SWAN or a PA cath, even something like a Vigileo or a flow track if we want a less invasive measure. And we can also use the bedside ultrasound like I talked about for a non-invasive way to measure the stroke volume. And so after we have that measure, we are going to lay the patient flat and then we're going to raise their legs to 45 degrees. And so what we're doing here is we're redistributing the venous return from the lower legs to the central circulation. And this is effectively giving them a transient fluid bolus without actually giving them any fluid. And this is the equivalent to around 500 mLs of a fluid bolus. We then monitor their stroke volume and or their cardiac index. It usually takes at least 30 to 90 seconds to see the maximum effect, and if we see an increase of at least 10% in their stroke volume or 15% in their cardiac index, that this indicates a high probability that they will be fluid responsive. Now, the fluid bolus that we're giving them is actually temporary, and as soon as we reposition them back to normal, this is going to go away. And what's really great about this is we can repeatedly use this technique to continue to evaluate their responsiveness. And then finally, there are some patients that just may not be able to do the passive leg raise. In cases with these patients, we can also do a small fluid bolus, typically anywhere from 100 to 250 mLs, to serve as a fluid challenge. So here again, we want to be able to measure stroke volume or cardiac index, 
take record of that measurement before giving the fluid, and then again after we give them the bolus and it's infused. Here again, if we see the same 10% in stroke volume or 15% in cardiac index, that once again this is going to potentially indicate that they are a fluid responder. So that's sort of our approach and evaluation when it comes to whether or not our patient is going to be responsive to giving them fluids or not. It's really important that we have some way of determining where our patient lies on this Frank Starling curve because we don't want to be giving them fluids if we don't have to, but we also want to determine those patients who would benefit from it. So I covered a lot of information here, but hopefully this helps to give you guys a little bit better of an idea of some of the measures and assessments and tools that we have at our disposal to try and determine who these patients are. I hope that you guys were able to learn something from this and that you guys liked the lesson. If you did, please leave me a like down below. It really goes a long way to help support this channel in the eyes of the YouTube algorithm. Also, leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you thought of this lesson. I love reading your comments and trying to respond to every one of you guys, as well as subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Make sure and share this lesson with anybody else too that you think might find it useful. A special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys are willing to show this channel is truly appreciated and is really going to allow me to continue to grow and do better things with this channel in the future. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in showing support for this channel and seeing some of the additional perks that you get for doing just that, you can join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out what those benefits are. You can also support this channel by following some of the links down in the lesson description, as well as checking out some of the awesome shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you stay tuned for the next lesson in this series, otherwise check out a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, have a great day.